Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present the results today. Um, no, nothing to disclose. Uh, as we all know, uh, perforation of the esophagus is a life-threatening condition associated with high morbidity and mortality rates. And this is especially true for Bahaba syndrome. Uh, we just have to look at the etiology of the perforation. It's, it's pyrogenic and thus facilitating their uh, contamination of the surrounding tissues. Uh, when we go into literature, we see that we have conservative, operative, and endoscopic treatment options to deal with the situation. But uh, we also see that we have that there's actually no generally accepted treatment algorithm for this clinical situation. What we did was a monocentric retrospective analysis over a 10 years period. We had 19 patients, predominantly male. Uh, all of them received a CT scan of the thorax and the abdomen at uh, admission. All of them were admitted to the intensive care unit. Antibiotic and antimicrotic treatment was started right away. And all of them received uh, endoscopy, all but one patient. I'll talk about that special case later on. Um, we had in total four treatment groups. The first one, conservative endoscopic, one patient. What does this mean? It means that only a diagnostic endoscopy without any interventional procedure was performed. Then initially 17 patients were assigned to the therapeutic endoscopic group, which means that one or more interventional procedures were performed, but 10 of them required additional surgery. It's quite obvious that that's a major issue and the most important treatment group will focus on that also later on. And the one patient who presented clinical unstable already at admission was uh, scheduled for emergency surgery right away. Uh, in 18 patients, a total of uh, 72 endoscopic procedures were performed. You see stand placement, endosponge, uh, over the scope clip application. All of them received nasogastric tubes and one patient received uh, feeding uh, gastrostomy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, 10 out of 19 patients required additional surgery after initial endoscopic treatment. Uh, surgery um, was um, three cornerstones of surgery. We, we did debridement, lavage, and drainage. Um, when you need to do additional surgery in that special situation, you can do it minimal invasive. You see here we did four laparoscopies and for thoracoscopies, and I think one of the main messages is that we, uh, there was no need for uh, esophagectomy in all cases. Length of stay, uh, median length of hospital stay, uh, 21 days, and median length of intensive care unit stay 16 days. The outcome in hospital mortality was three out of 19 patients. All of these patients uh, belong to the uh, group who received initially endos an endoscopic treatment, but received uh, additional surgery after a median of two days. All of them had a bunch of comorbidities and all of them, two of them died because of myocardial infarction, one of them due to malignant arrhythmia. At that time point, uh, um, the sequel of the perforation was not the reason for their death. One patient um, was readmitted to our department because of symptomatic stenosis after an endospotch treatment. He required repetitive dilatations. Just to sum this up very quick is that if you have a stable patient with uh, Pohaba syndrome, I think it is um, okay to, to, to take non-operative uh, treatment options into consideration and not abandon them in the first place. If the patient shows clinical signs of deterioration, beginning fever, climbing glycosides, you have to perform additional operative interventions even before signs of severe sepsis occur. When you have to do additional surgery, you can do it minimal invasive. Endoscopic procedures are associated with a good functional outcome. There was just this one patient with uh, recurrent dysphagia requiring dilatations. And I think I also mentioned it before, the main message is also that esophagectomy was prevented in all 19 cases. Thank you very much for your attention.